Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Bill Fisher. I'm on the faculty of the School of Library and Information Science at San Jose State. I want to welcome you to this colloquium uh, presentation, part of our spring colloquium uh, series. Uh, today we have uh, a couple of people representing everylibrary.org. Uh, we have with us today John Kraschka, who is the founder of Every Library. Uh, .org. John is, uh, has an uh, extensive background in dealing with associations, uh, association support, membership recruitment, governance activities, uh, things like this. Uh, he um, is also uh, or was also the uh, head of membership development for the American Library Association and is currently the president of the Board of Trustees for the Berwyn, Illinois Public Library. With John today is a Every Library uh, board member, Patrick Sweeney. Patrick is a uh, branch manager for the San Mateo County Public Libraries. Uh, Patrick is a 2005 graduate of our program here at San Jose State, and he is very active in ALA. He's actually on the governing council, is a, a member at large. Uh, he's also active with uh, the California Library Association, and um, let me turn things over now to John and Patrick for their presentation. Bill, thank you very much. Uh, this is John. Uh, I'm going to take the first half of the presentation, and uh, Patrick's going to take the second half, unless, of course, I stumble on something, and Patrick needs to come in and correct me. The, uh, the chance to talk to, to the San Jose community uh, is wonderful, and the chance to be able to participate in um, the extension of what you guys do in class all the time uh, is great as well. There's a lot of, of uh, what doesn't they, what don't they teach us in library school. I think San Jose does a better than average job of teaching it in library school, but there's some things about uh, working on the ground when it comes to uh, political campaigns election days that are focused on libraries um, that isn't necessarily part of the core curriculum. So I'm very glad that we're here today to be able to talk about that. Uh, not only for libraries that are looking to go out for a vote, have something before the voters, but also to, to look at this information, this data, this way to, to talk about uh, library campaigns for everyday advocacy. Um, the subtitle of this project today is How to Run Against Your Own Library and Win. Uh, if that intrigues you, we will certainly have a lot to talk about when it comes to running campaigns. Uh, before we get into the material, I want to tell you a little bit about Every Library. Um, Every Library is a new animal in the library advocacy ecosystem. Um, the historic um, posture among libraries, libraries and library associations, foundations, organizations, is that they're set up in particular ways that date back a long time. They all have validity. They all have their um, their role. Uh, they all have their strengths. In fact, uh, you know, as an active member of ALA and the Illinois Library Association, as an active um, uh, participant in legislative days and uh, advocacy moments for my own library, I like what associations do. But there's a place um, that we don't focus on historically uh, because of the way we're built, as an or the way associations and foundations and other organizations are built. And that day tends to be election day. Also, the public libraries themselves, as public entities, are hampered by uh, certain things that keep uh, politicians honest. Uh, the Hatch Act of 1912 is what we, we can point to with, with, with immediacy that says you cannot expend money on the conduct of, an, of a campaign. You cannot expend public money or use public time on the conduct of a campaign. Now, within that scope, though, there is a lot of information that needs to be conducted. Uh, transmitted to the public, and we're going to talk about ways to do that um, with some verve and alacrity as we move forward in this presentation. But every library is set up in a way that is different. We're set up as a, uh, instead of a charitable organization or a unit of government, we're set up as a uh, 501c4. Uh, it's a super PAC for libraries. Um, as a super PAC, we're set up primarily to work on supporting local libraries when there's a measure before the voters. Uh, it might be a bond to build a new building, maybe the first time since Carnegie died, that you're going to go out and ask the public for a couple of million dollars to, to take care of the space that we do librarianing in. Uh, other kinds of referendums, 
parcel taxes, uh, levies, millages, warrant articles. There's a lot of different names for those, those funding measures, but they're all the basic taxes that public libraries function on. Um, libraries appropriate monies in two different ways, of course. One is through some sort of a regular process that the Board of Trustees or city or county government conducts um, that levies taxes. Usually they're based on property around the country. Sometimes they're based on sales or use or special taxes. Um, but when those measures are before the voters, um, it's a different matter because we have an election day and we need to talk to voters particularly. The uninformed voter is our biggest challenge. Every library exists in a way to, to help support both the local library when it goes out with an information only campaign and the local vote yes committee that's organized in order to help uh, citizens move this, this issue forward for the good of their, their community. Um, every library is also set up in a way that helps support legislation that impacts the library's ability to function as a district. What that means is um, when there's something that's moving through uh, state government or if there's a statewide ballot initiative that influences the library or impacts the library's ability to raise and expend revenue, um, we would like to be in that kind of a place. And Patrick, if you have one second to talk about what uh, Every Library California is doing around that, uh, this would be a good time to jump in. Sure, sure, John. Um, yeah, so right now we are working on Every Library California, which is um, set up not as a C4 as we're talking about Every Library National but it's set up as a, um, a general ballot committee in the state to campaign on behalf of any statewide proposition that comes out around libraries. So um, right now we're specifically talking about um, uh, a proposition SCA 7, um, which is a state constitutional amendment which would allow the voting threshold for um, library tax measures to be lowered from 66 percent down to 55 percent, which is just more democratic and means that we'll be able to win campaigns easier for, um, for libraries specifically. There's a couple other um, statewide propositions that could come out that every library in California um, is looking at uh, that we are willing to back if SCA 7 doesn't go through. Um, SCA 7 and uh, there's another building bill that just came out. Um, are both the credit the credit to getting those into the legislation in the first place is totally and completely with S with CLA and their lobbying. Um, once that happens and it gets before the voters, that's where we take over. So um, that is what we're working on. If you're interested in getting involved in that, we can uh, talk about getting involved in some kind of voter impact um, activities that we're doing in the next year. When it gets back down to the, or when it gets back out to every library national, so that voter activity, uh, the the chance to focus um, communications out to the public in an information only setting, or to work with a vote yes committee and campaign that's been set up in town, every library is built in a way, and we receive donations nationally from individuals, corporations, unions, and other political action committees to do this. Uh, so we provide consulting, we provide pre planning and assistance, polling. Uh, we work on the roles, uh, defining the roles and encouraging the roles that staff, trustees, friends and foundations have. And we really look to make sure that the issues that are in the public trust, that we're about to become a, a new appropriator in that community. We're about to, to ask people to pay additional or sustaining taxes for our library. Those issues in the public trust are, are what we, we, we focus our work on. We focus at work uh, based in, in two areas. One is data about the library when it comes to voter perception. And I'm going to get into that really heavily in the next moment or two. The other, um, the other aspect of it is from the political sciences, uh, looking at how candidates, campaigns behave when it comes to voter activation. Um, the library is a, is a little bit different than a candidate. Uh, the li library is a little bit different than even a school bond initiative would be or a parks and rec bond because of our unique brand. Um, in the data, uh, OCLC and Pew and ALA and all these different groups are asking the voters, asking the public a lot about what they, they perceive libraries to be. We just had a major release from Pew the day before yesterday. Um, the data looks great. The data says 94% of parents 
the libraries are very important to their children. Or 79% say very important. 94% of all parents um, say that, that they're an important institution. It's wonderful. It's a great place to stand on. 58% of Americans have a library card. 62% of cardholders have come to the library at least once in, a, uh, once in this past year. Those are all good places to start from. What really matters to us when we're talking about elections, though, is what do the voters say? Uh, this information about the 34, sorry, 37% of voters who will definitely vote yes for the library comes from OCLCs from awareness to funding. From awareness to funding, we could do a master's class on the data that's within that because when they were not talking broadly to the American public, they were talking to registered voters. Uh, the behavior of registered voters on election day uh, is all that really matters when we're talking about election days. The fact that they have a library card or they don't have a library card, now we'll get into that. But 37% of the American voting public says on a model or sample ballot that they will definitely vote for the library. 37% additionally will probably vote for the library if they can have a question or two answered. Um, if they have a, a chance to, to engage the material. They have a baseline of support. You would look at this and say 74% of the American public, the American voting public, would vote yes. Unfortunately, this is not for a particular campaign. This is an in general. Um, this is not taking into account voter turnout for that particular election day. This is not taking into account any of the particular demographics uh, in the community, that specific zip code level community nor is it necessarily taking into account uh, voter sentiment around, around uh, that particular measure that particular day. But there is a natural environment of support by voters. The 94% of parents, that's cool, they're in somewhere in this Venn diagram. But the 74% of voters who are swayable to say yes on election day for new funding does exist. Um, the 26% of the American voting public who probably or definitely will vote no, they tend to fall into um, two groups. One is a zero-sum game approach, where if the parks don't get it, or the police don't get it, or the um, um, you know some other unit in, in, in government doesn't get it, then why should the library get it? The other group, uh, psychographically here, is essentially anyone who says that any tax is a bad tax. Uh, the Tea Party types, they're a group that we, we need to serve uh, every day when they come into the library, but on election day, we don't necessarily talk to them. We're not looking to convert hearts and minds here. We're not necessarily interested in making sure that they love the library. I'm perfectly comfortable with a group of people who are rationally ignorant but favorably disposed to the library who we can activate as our voters. Um, when, why do we talk about politics when we talk about libraries? Because your funders, who are the public at, this, at one moment, or elected officials who control your city or county uh, 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 general appropriation, or your state uh, representatives and senators, or your federal senators and, 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 and representatives listen to voters. And when only 37% of the American public is a definite supporter, we've got some ground to cover. Um, the big question that we have for you and the big question that we're trying to answer as a new super PAC for libraries is how to activate those 37% who are definites and sway those other 37% who are probables. In many states, we need 50% plus one. In some other states, we need 60%. In other in states like California, we need 66.7%. 66.7% of the voters in that particular election to say yes, to vote yes for that funding measure. Uh, there is a lot of ground uh, there's a lot of ground to cover. In the data, back to OCLC from awareness to funding, uh, the characteristics of individuals who are in that 37% who definitely or 37% who probably will vote yes. The biggest thing that came out of that uh, uh, series of, of surveys that they, 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 that they did with OCLC is that someone's willingness to support increased library funding is not driven by or limited by their use of the library. Baseline on this is that somebody who has not been to the library since they were 14 years old, somebody who has not darkened your door who's now 24, 54, 84 years old, they could still vote yes for the library because they believe in the institution. Um, the individual, likewise, who comes in every single day, uses all of your stuff, 
builds their life around what they found at the library may not vote for you. Uh, if we strictly rely on an inbound service model to communicate with voters or advocates, we are potentially missing half of our electorate or half of our, our, our um, uh, base of, of advocacy support. Um, use does not matter when it comes to actually saying yes to the library. What the voter perceives about the library, the belief that the voter has about the library is the driver in many ways for whether or not they're going to punch a chad for you or if they're going to uh, go out of their way to help you lobby county government, city government, state and federal. Um, the perception the library is not just a provider of practical answers and information. Committed supporters hold a belief, and I love that they use the word belief here, the belief that the library is a transformational force. Um, it may defy, defy reason and logic. It may defy actually your current service plan. This goes back to why do we run against our library sometimes because, you know, right now we might not be doing it great. Uh, we might need some additional resources that come from funding or, or allies and endorsers or other kinds of support, but the belief among the electorate is that the library has the potential to be a transformational force. If you are currently in a, in a library that is doing that sort of work, and many of you are, and many of you strive for that every day, activating that belief drives additional support either at the ballot box or as advocates. There's not a, there's not a demographic in the data. There's not a demographic that drives uh, residents' uh, willingness to increase their taxes. It is a perception and attitude about the library. And this is revolutionary from, from OCLC's from awareness to funding perspective. It's not just about the library as an institution. It's also about the librarian. That is going to be a place to hang our hat, to frame our discussion, and to communicate with voters. But there is the library which does things and is a place that, and it is also the librarian who is him or herself the change agent in their community. Activating that, uh, giving them a perception of what you do every day and showing that you are engaged in that work of the library is the thing that really drives home uh, decisions to support. Okay, let's talk just for a moment about who these people are and their characteristics. I've talked to you about their belief structure, but what, how do you identify them? There's a lot on the page here. You're going to get the slides later. I'm going to take you through it real quick. These are individuals, the people who are in the 37% range, uh, who are definite supporters or even the probable supporters, they are involved in their communities. They are involved in their communities does not mean that they are necessarily civically engaged. Uh, they are individuals who are involved in some community of intention. That might be uh, somebody who is a knitter or quilter who makes little baby booties for premature babies, and they do it in a community way. It might be somebody who's involved in a church, synagogue, uh, mosque. It might be somebody who is a volunteer coach, uh, you know, for, for a sports team. There's a community of orientation that they are involved with. Um, if there, that doesn't preclude anybody who is, is more of a solo practitioner, but it is easier to find people in communities because it's also possible to make allies with those communities. They recognize the importance of the library in the community as an anchor institution as well as to a child's education, how the library stands in a gap. They're not always heavy users of the library. Again, the word belief is in here. It's a noble place, important and relevant to the community. We are at an interesting and critical junction about people's perception of library and the transformation of collections from being printed material and other tangibles into ebooks and other downloads means that we have to, I think, work a little bit harder as we move into the 21st century on making sure that our, 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 we are continue to be viewed as an important and noble and relevant place in the community. The library is a vital community resource. They believe that on a continuum between police and fire, parks, schools, uh, public recreation, you know, sports teams, that whole thing, the library is part of that continuum, and they are willing to increase their taxes to support it. You've got to give them a good reason so why we do good strategic planning, but the biggest thing here is that they recognize the value of a passionate librarian as the true advocate for lifelong learning in that community. Um, the passionate librarian, I've got a whole slide for this, for this. I'm going to let it hang here for a second. 
because the perception not only of the institution, but of you as the professional. And I want to say, like, when, when, when the public comes back and says librarian, they mean everybody who works there, not just the MLS. I have a great deal of respect for the MLS. I do not have one myself. That being said, I understand what it's like to walk into the building and have that, that, the frontline clerk be, my, be the librarian. Um, if they are passionate and engaged the same way you are, uh, we are in a much better place when it comes to talking to voters and to talking to potential advocates. So to recap, um, there's no difference between somebody who is a user and a non-user. The, 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 my favorite example is the, uh, the fact that before I had kids, which was many, many blissful years, before I had kids, I voted for the parks all the time. Even though as a single white guy hanging around the parks, it would probably have been a class whatever misdemeanor if I got – I didn't use them. I didn't use them at all, but I needed a place for those kids to go that quite frankly was not my lawn. Uh, it's a perfectly valid reason for me as a voter to say yes to an initiative that improves the parks. Same thing goes for somebody who's not been to the library in an awfully long time. Likewise, the person who's coming in to, to check out materials, to use your services all the time, may or may not vote for you and may or may not be your best advocate. We need to figure out how to activate uh, those people with the belief that you and your institutions are transform transformational. In the data, uh, and you can dig into it really hard, there's no difference between the progressives and conservatives. We can use that as a, as a cipher for Democrat and Republican. We can use it as, uh, by way of example of the mom who comes in with um, uh, the homeschooling mom who comes in with her kids, looking for materials, looking for some, some connection, looking to perhaps use a program, uh, extend her child's education. Uh, is she part of a, a, a traditionally uh, progressive hippie collective, or is she part of a uh, base church homeschooling movement? And if we can use those as proxies for, for progressive and conservative, uh, there's an opportunity for her to vote yes or to become your advocate because she understands the transformative power of what you guys do. The one group that does matter when it comes to attitude, of course, as I said before, is the any tax is a bad tax community. I think we as an industry need to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, fundamentally, nothing impacts a voter or an advocate's behavior more than their perception of, of you and your institution. There's a lot of institutional perception out there. How many people know a librarian? Okay, campaign land, political sciences land. What activates voters? Um, these seven factors activate voters for the president, for the governor, for the mayor, for the city council members, for any initiative that's on the line, uh, that, that is on the uh, the ballot, including library. Um, the big two are. When you have a, a, an information-only campaign that you're waging as a library, for us to activate the people who have a culture, tradition, or habit of voting for the library by informing them that there's something on the ballot, the people like myself who have voted in every election since Dukakis versus Bush, I go in and I vote for every single thing. It's the first time that I have ever interacted with your ballot measure language is there at the polling place, and I'm not in the base of 37% who definitely will vote yes when the library, when the word library is on the ballot, if I'm in that other 37% who needs to, to have some Q&A happen, if the first time I've, I'm looking at, at a, an appropriation of a couple million dollars is on the ballot box, you can flip a coin about whether or not I'm going to vote yes. So information-only campaigns need to make sure that they hit people who have the culture, tradition, or habit of voting. But every single campaign, the, the info-only and the vote yes side, need to expose people uh, to the candidates or the issue. The single biggest difference between the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign was a knock on the door in certain precincts, a knock on the door that said, hi, I'm John, I'm with the Obama campaign. That never happened with the Romney campaign. Well, I'm not to say it never happened. There's people who are going to be doing doctoral dissertations on, the, on that campaign for years to come. But in certain key precincts that tipped certain states, which tipped the Electoral College, the Obama campaign had a, a, a on-the-ground, get-out-the-vote campaign that said, hi, I'm John, I'm with this campaign, I want to tell you about my candidate. You see it all the time, people walking the precinct, uh, getting out in front of the voters and saying, hi, I'm John, I'm running for mayor, I'm running for uh, city council, I'm running for whatever it may be. The thing that tips people on election day which is a weird day out of the other 365 of the year, is knowing who that human being is. How do we get 
the librarian out in front of people because nothing impacts voter behavior more than the perception of you and your institution. The institution has a record, but do you have visibility? And then, of course, the awareness that there's a measure on the ballot, which means we've got to do effective information-only campaigning. Our thesis at every library, and the thesis that we're, we're helping to win campaigns with, is that the librarians need to view themselves as the candidate. Um, when there is a measure on the ballot, we tend to talk about the library. The library is the incumbent in the, in the race. Incumbency both as an anchor institution, but also with a record. When we want to run on our record, we say additional money, new money, renewed money will uh, help advance what we've done already so well as your incumbent, but I am the candidate here. Me and my colleagues do this kind of work all the time. We are the candidate uh, that we want to put in front of you that, that, that says we're, we're manifesting it. Likewise, if there's an incumbent record that is not so good in a community, what is new money on election day? What is new money from city or county governments? What is new money from, from state or federal look like? Or from funders, or from donors, or from grant makers, et cetera, et cetera. What does that new money do to fix the problems that we have? You can run on or against your library's record as long as you are the one who is running that campaign. Um, it means that you are the candidate. Um, it means that you are out there in front of the voters in a way that may be different, massively different, than how you do service 364 days of the year. But on that election day, on that day where the, uh, the budget is being approved, you need to be in a, in a position to talk about what your vision is and how it moves the community forward. Um, how do we extend that influence out there further? That's our next big question. On election day, you can do it. Well, we'll get to that. But we need to also be aware that, that when we're not in an election cycle, working like a campaign does, working in terms of putting the voter, I'm sorry, working in terms of putting the candidate out in front of the voter works every single time. You might not win every single time, but you've moved the conversation forward about what librarians do, the relevance of librarianship in, in that community, and the relevance of, of librarianship in the modern age. Okay, we looked at seven things that activate voters. There are seven very similar things that activate advocates. Hey, yeah, we need to go talk to city council. We got to go talk to county government because our budget is going to potentially be cut, or we have weathered cuts over the last several years through the recession. What does it look like to 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 extend or restore funding? They need to have an experience uh, as advocates of the issue and prior success as an advocate. It lines up pretty neatly. Uh, with what activates voters. The personal contact with a candidate, the hi, knock on the door, I'm John, I'm with the campaign, hi, I'm John, I'm running for city council, um, is also the, uh, yeah, hi, I'm John, I'm your librarian. You know what is happening in this building, uh, or let me tell you what's happening in this building that impacts our community, that experience of the issue, the same techniques, the same uh, little mental touch points among either voters or advocates, somebody that you've, you've motivated to become an ally and is going to stand with you in front of your funders, this is all valid. And you're still the candidate. Um, if you're not up for election day where you're running, you're up as an advocate and you're still inspiring people uh, to move with you towards new funding opportunities. There's a whole series of exercises that we do with campaigns around uh, who is your ally, who's your, who's your endorser. But the biggest thing is, quite frankly, early contact. Um, the chance to move through the seven different areas of civil society, of, our, of, our, of our, our ecosystem, through our educational partners, you can go through and do the inventory. Who's our K-12? Who's our pre-K? Who is our community college and university? Who is our for-profit um, or nonprofit tutoring allies? All of those different groups, when you're going to be mounting a campaign, uh, if you were going to go out as a candidate, you're going to go look at them. Uh, if you're running for office, you need to go look at all these different groups. Um, the governmental partners, the civic partners, the politicians who are out there, the earlier you can get to them. And even if, if early is a couple weeks before this current ballot initiative is, is hitting the voters, get to them uh, in an early way as you, as the librarian not as a representative of your own institution. That's what the friends do, that's what the foundation folks do, that's what citizen committees do. They're your representatives, 
but you yourself are the authentic candidate who goes and talks to them about what new or renewed funding does to advance our common cause. Your allies become your endorsers, your allies become your funders, your allies become your volunteers. Um, the, 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 the drive exclusively to win on Election Day that is going to win at all costs is not something we ever recommend. In the 365 days of the year, Election Day is particularly weird. Budget hearing days are particularly weird, but the other 364 days, um, what happens the day after the election? Your campaign needs to be anticipating both a win, where you're moving things forward, and a loss, where you need your allies and endorsers to be. Same thing goes for the budget hearing day. What happens the day after? If you have gotten your, 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 your segments of society in alongside you, uh, it's not magic. It's not magic coal. But it does make for a better coalition for your uh, for your local um, uh, for your local library. Campaigns do it every day by walking a precinct or canvassing for voters. Uh, they're driving towards that particular election day because putting a candidate out in front of the voters, putting a, uh, a candidate in front of the advocates, attracts attention. It activates people's perception and activates their, their, their willingness to say yes to a new measure. Walking and phoning work great. Social media, uh, and Patrick's going to talk about this a little bit later, but social media is, is a place that also puts you as a human being in front of them uh, in a way that's different than online advertising. The stuff that works less well is towards the bottom of the list. The newsletter that uh, goes out is great. But the newsletter that has stories about how you, who are the librarians working and doing this kind of, of, of change in the community, works much better. Rooting it in your biography. Well, Patrick's going to get into that uh, now in terms of rooting it in your biography. Uh, Patrick, you've been probably following the chat more than I have. Is there anything that came up in this, in this first half that we need to address? Um, there, was the, uh, there, was, there was a discussion about um, where funding comes from, uh, Sylvia, I think, posted. Uh, you know, she she made the comment that that a lot of a lot of people don't know where library funding comes from, and that was one of the things oh. that that we run into. John and I run into quite a bit, uh, a terrifying amount that people don't know where the paychecks come from. I don't know if you want to touch on that real quick. Sure, sure. Uh, depends on your jurisdiction. Uh, somewhere north of ninety percent of public library funding comes from uh, locally appropriated taxes um, in the zip codes that the library serves. Um, some states, uh, some, some libraries is 93%, some places it's 97% of your entire operating budget is appropriated within a few feet to miles of your library. Um, that is appropriated under two or three different kinds of, of regular order. Um, one of that could be the work that the trustees do uh, every year setting a budget. And, and, and moving the, the, the tax rate around to fit that budget. The other could be with city or county government um, that is making some sort of a, a, a levy on property taxes generally. Um, that's done as part of the normal budgeting process for the library uh, and for the city, for public works, for parks and rec, for uh, running the, uh, the, 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 the city hall. All those kinds of things were bundled into that. Um, and there's a lot of horse trading that has to go on when it's city or county government because no politician wants to raise the taxes for no good reason. The other pro process, of course, is what we've been talking about when it comes to going out for election day. Um, when there's an extraordinary measure before the voters, something that needs an increase above what the limiting rate is that the trustees are empowered to do by statute, uh, or it's a big project like a bond initiative to build a building or remodel a building, and that's when the voter it agrees to have their taxes changed or disagrees from that as, as well. That's one of the things we're trying to work on. Um, so the other couple of percent that comes in for the, 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 the average public library, it might be 10%, it might be 7%, it might be 5%, it might be 3% comes in from federal, state, and other soft money sources. Um, I'm not casting any aspersions on what friends and foundations do, what our grant-making partners do, what appropriations look like in, um, in, in, in D.C. or at, at uh, the state level. But last year, um, 
on ballots alone, there was $253 million being appropriated or being asked to, to be appropriated by the, by the voters. Um, the entire federal appropriation for libraries is somewhere between $147 million and $187 million, um, depending on, on who's you know, sequesters and all the other stuff that's going on. Um, there's a lot more at stake um, in, in a per annum basis on those local elections. The entire library industry is about $12 billion a year. If you spread it out across all 9,500-ish uh, library systems in this country, um, that's an awful lot of money being uh, appropriated in county government, city government, and by trustees. Um, the particulars of, of, of moving any uh, single budget thing forward are always particular to that, to, to, to that uh, uh, budget hearing, but the techniques we're talking about here are uh, consistently useful and consistently successful when you identify yourself as the candidate and a legitimate uh, uh, change agent in the community for this anchor institution. Right. So, um, thank you, John. Um, so, I'm going to start talking about messaging. And messaging is one of the key things that you can do in any campaign, or even uh, even better, to start doing your messaging when you don't have a campaign, so that later on when you do, you don't have to message so hard. Um, all the money that's being spent in your campaign is being spent around uh, making sure that your message gets out in front of voters. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, one of the things that um, your library has as a message is its vision statement. Um, John and I did a presentation at PLA uh, just a couple of days ago, and we asked the room of about 40 people if they could recite their, um, their, their library's uh, vision statement, and two people could do it. Um, and that that was that was kind of that was kind of terrifying. Um, one person had a terrible vision statement. We can, if, if you want more help talking about that, um, and, and what a vision statement, how to draft a vision statement, we can talk about that some other time. But um, but know that message and live that message is really really important. And I'm going to talk about getting that message out and what that message means. So um, first thing you need to remember uh, when you're talking to your voters and your community about the library is that you need to remember that the voter, that whether or not they are a library user doesn't matter at all. If they're in your library, if they're outside your library, they're just as likely to vote for your library. Um, so you need to talk to them in a little bit different way, but either way you need to be talking to both groups of people uh, equally. So for example, um, people who are in your library, people who are library users, people who uh, are in there all the time, uh, it's really easy to, to after messaging for them, um, you know, it's just as you know, uh, this is what happened in the library. Um, as you know, uh, you use our computers all the time to apply for jobs. As you know, uh, the librarian Mary helped you uh, with your resume, as you know, um, those kinds of things. So that's very, very easy. To non-users, uh, just a slight shift in saying, as you can imagine, our librarians help uh, community members apply for jobs. Um, as you can imagine, um, there's a strong digital divide in our community, uh, and the library provides a service to bridge that gap. Um, and that is the difference between communicating with uh, library users and non-users. Once again, remember, whether they're a user or not, doesn't matter. You need to talk to them equally. Um, voters typically see the library as a uh, transformative force. Um, they see the library as the incumbent. Um, you are the one who was there last year and the year before. So um, they already have an idea about who you are and what the library does and what it, they already have a vision about the library. Um, they see it as, a, as an educational partner, an educational development engine, um, and then just real quick on the economic development engine, uh, every library is doing a lot of work uh, working with um, uh, uh, startup, startup organizations and entrepreneurs to let them know about library services in communities. They just sent um, a bunch of librarians to South by Southwest. If you haven't checked that out, take a look at some of the communication that happened between 
librarians and um, and and the startup community. It was I think it was pretty huge. Um, Innovative sponsored a booth there and everything, so it was it was a really big deal. Um, but that's part of getting that message out that the library is an economic development engine. Um, as a social leveler, place of discovery, a personal refuge, all those things are important. Um, that is the messaging to use. So uh, the library as the incubator, um, talking once again about that South by Southwest, we have a lot of businesses that come into our library. They are uh, excited that we are there when, when we communicate with them that we are more than welcome willing to work with them to give them the resources they need to start up their businesses or to improve their businesses. We have things that, um, databases that would cost their business tens of thousands of dollars if they're to purchase them on their own. Uh, we provide that stuff to businesses. I think that's a huge area that we need to move into a lot more um, and, and promote that we are the incubator in a community uh, for, um, for startups and for businesses. Uh, I think that that fights a lot of that any tax is a bad tax. Uh, I think it helps get out um, the message that libraries aren't just a um, social welfare organization. Um, we also promote the arts. Um, we help cultivate a community identity. So many libraries have that historical center. Um, and then, of course, library as leverage. We help uh, government organizations get grants um, and build capacity. We allow access to tech and retail anchors. Um, libraries have one of the most prominent retail spaces in a lot of communities. Uh, a lot of the businesses around my community would kill for my foot traffic. Um, we are we are probably the busiest thing in our business district, um, and that brings a lot of people down to our business district. So uh, we also have that as leverage. So once again, you know, John was talking about the, the the perception of the library of the librarian. Um, nothing impacts voter behavior more than their perception of the librarian and the library institution. Really what I'm saying is that you are the candidate as, as the librarian. You're the one that people vote for, and it's their relationship to you that, that they are voting for when they're talking about uh, uh, funding libraries. So that's why it's so important um, to become the passionate librarian. Um, you know, if you know your own story, um, your own biography, and why you work in the library, uh, that is what is important. Um, that's something that you should have in your elevator speech when you're talking to your community, when you go and you speak to uh, city council. Um, think about why it is that you work in the library and why it is that it matters to you so much, because that story really, really matters to people. Um, and in the second part, what is your best story about helping an individual or the community change? Um, change is a great messaging uh, device in talking about changing the community. Uh, I mean, clearly it was, it was Barack Obama's big message, right? So um, uh, what I want to say about this is that we do a lot in numbers. We talk about statistics. Um, we talk about the number of people who checked out books, how many people came into the library, how many people with the story time. Uh, none of that matters when you're talking about messaging. Uh, one of the big things that I would love to see happen is librarians stop talking to politicians about the five million people that came to their library. Five million is just such a huge, ridiculous number that you can't really fathom what that actually means. And, and the politicians, if you want to see their eyes glaze over, walk into their office and say, you know, last year 5,547,346 people came into my library. Uh, they checked out 12,700,000, you know. Um, none of that worked. They don't really understand that. But how many of you guys still remember Joe the plumber, right? And that was one guy in a community. His story wasn't uh, it, it wasn't the same story that everybody else has. It wasn't the average story. It was an, a, a, an outlier story, but it really did a lot for the campaign. Um, these are the kind of stories that shape campaigns. These are the kind of stories that when the politician goes in front of voters and they want to talk about um, 
uh, getting voters behind the library. These are the stories that they need to have in their pocket to be able to talk to voters about supporting the library. Um, politicians can be your biggest advocate if they have the tools to become your advocate. So if if, if you guys go to a library and the um, the annual report has a whole bunch of numbers in it, uh, seriously sit down and try and talk to people about collecting the stories. Um, our, our own library system switched from being very, very number heavy to being very, very story heavy. Um, and we collected stories all year long for our, our annual report, and we do that every year now. It's really those stories of impact that really, really matter and really resonate people. That's what people remember stories of impact. So as you go about your day, one of the great things that you can do and one of the tools that you can that you can use is if you have a great story of impact, um, write it down. Write down, you know, I'm the librarian who helped uh, Steve find a job after he'd been homeless for two years and, um, you know, he used our computers to access the job and um, Susan, a librarian, helped him build his resume and helped him submit it. And now he has a job and he's a productive member of the community and bringing in so much money into the community. Um, I am the librarian who helped Johnny learn to read, uh, and now he's going to Harvard. Uh, that's actually one of the stories that our annual report has. We have an after-school reading program. Um, and in that after-school reading program, one of our students hated to read when he first came in the third grade, refused to do it. Um, we have uh, a great, passionate staff member who helped him learn to read, uh, and he's going to Stanford on a scholarship um, from a very, very poor family who couldn't send him to college uh, if they wanted to. They couldn't pay for it. So I mean, these are the kind of stories that, that really resonate with people. Uh, so take some time throughout your day or, or throughout your week, or if, if something happens that that you think is outstanding that you want to get before city council and talk about, or before the voters and talk about, just take a couple of minutes and write those down. Um, so here's what you can start doing uh, tomorrow. These are things that you guys can do in your library that you can walk away from this webinar with and and implement immediately. Um, these are great things um, and just tools and tactics that we've taken from um, campaigns around the country that libraries can utilize right away um, to make an impact in their community. So first of all, uh, John kind of touched on it, phoning and walking, um, those are two of the most significant ways to hit in front of voters. They're also the most time consuming um, and they're also the most uncomfortable. I am, uh, I'm working with my staff to try and talk them into doing a door-to-door -door library card campaign um, for September. Uh, I would love to get my, my staff members and my friends out in the community knocking on doors, asking people if they have a library card, signing up for a library card. If they already have a library card, um, handing them information or talking to them about the library and what the library means to them. But that direct community access um, and that, that direct community contact is, is so important to building up a relationship with the librarians. Um, once again, anybody behind a desk is a librarian to them, so it doesn't matter who goes out. Um, phoning is a great tactic if you are running your campaign. It's a little bit more difficult if you aren't running your campaign. Um, the random calls are, are, uh, aren't as accepted unless it's, it's political or something, so that one's kind of hard. But events and socials, um, you know, having events outside your library is uh, something that quite a few libraries are starting to do, having book clubs in the local bar or the local pub. Uh, it's a great opportunity to identify people who are advocates and activists of the library, but who might not come in to the library. Um, if you um, if you if you build these events into the culture of your organization, people are going to start feeling that they have a strong connection to their library in places where um, they might not otherwise. They won't see the library as some, you know, stonewalled institution up high on a the hill. They'll see it as part of their community. Um, the signs and mailers, uh, you know, they, they, they do present a tribal identity, putting them out in people's lawns, having uh, uh, bumper stickers that just say, I love the library. 
helps people identify with other community members and builds up that community of supporters and just helps them identify themselves, um, which is something that they feel good about. Um, mailers, uh, you know, aren't as effective. Um, they're, they're high cost, uh, low, low turnaround. Um, they're okay. They're okay. Um, you know, let me talk about one more thing here, though. Email lists. Uh, John and I have talked about this quite a bit, um, but email lists are one of the most significant things that you can be doing right now. Uh, if you don't have a, an email uh, list to mail to your community when you have a new program or event, um, you need to start building it. You can use MailChimp or something uh, or some other free, there's lots of free email services. And building that email list is super easy. Um, every event, every time you have a program, every time you have something that's, um, that draws in a lot of people, send around just a clipboard uh, with, um, with a sign-up sheet and people will sign it up. I mean, it's amazing. If you put a clipboard with a sign-up sheet in front of it that says name, email address, and pass it around the line, people will just sign up. It's that easy. Um, and with a big enough email list, it is incredibly easy to let your community know about some of the events that are going on in your community. It's incredibly easy to um, uh, tell the stories of, of impact that you have from the month. Um, it's incredibly easy to uh, let people know and just touch base with them and, and build up that relationship with them. Um, it's also incredibly easy to fundraise with a strong email list. Uh, we can talk about that too later. But um, All right, community engagement. Uh, I have to tell you that I am super excited because our library system just uh, hired a librarian whose entire job and responsibility in our in in my library right now is um, to not be in my library. Uh, John made a comment on Facebook talking about um, librarianing without the library, and that's going to pretty much be his job. Uh, he's going to be out in the community. He's going to be out doing programs and events and service delivery outside of the library. He's going to be talking directly to the community, tabling at events, um, and being engaged in our community. And that's, once again, that tactic of building up the relationship with community members directly with our librarians because it's that passionate librarian that they are going to vote for and that they're going to connect with and that they're going to have that relationship and that strong, positive relationship with the library. Um, training and role playing. For those of you guys in California, um, Henry Bankhead is the um, director of Los Gatos Library, and uh, um, he does an amazing staff training uh, for community or for uh, customer service, and it's entirely role playing through improv. It is supposed to be one of the most amazing things of all time. Um, but that training with role playing is super, super important. Um, social media, uh, we, in, we engage quite a bit in social media in a lot of our uh, campaigns. One of our most significant campaigns was the one in Louisiana, in Lafourche, Louisiana, where uh, we had a, a council person um, I don't know what to call him in, in this in this parish in Louisiana, but it's a council it's a councilman who made horrifically racist remarks about people who use the libraries, and he said it about three days before the election happened, and we built a social media campaign within 24 hours and had funds raised from that email list that we talked about earlier. Um, and enough funds raised to really reach out and, and flood the electorate with um, this message about how horribly racist the councilman is against you, and a vote for um, this council, a vote for this councilman's proposition against the library was um, a vote for racism was basically our message. Um, but in that in that time, we significantly impacted the election and and turned it around. Um, social media is so, so significant. Um, take some time and put some money behind your Facebook ad, direct your Facebook ad to your community, um, target them. Um, most importantly, again, put some money behind it. All right, so um, community services, community surveys, 
are a great way to um, introduce your library. You can have a community assessment survey, um, strategic planning surveys, key stakeholder surveys. Uh, you can also find out quite a bit about what your community thinks of your library and what you can change or what you need to do. It's incredibly important when you're doing a strategic plan uh, to allow the community to give input, to feel like they're a part of your community, or to feel like they're a part of your library. Um, it's an excellent way to get your message out to your community. Um, program events, you know, we talked about this just for a minute, uh, but having having programs that support your allies and endorsers, if the Rotary Club strongly endorses your library, um, you know, there's having having the Rotary Club in your library or having programs and events um, around that. Uh, we talked to Oakland Public Library who um, wanted to have uh, Clorox bleach do a program in their library about what Clorox bleach was and kind of the science behind the, what bleach was um, and have them endorse their, uh, endorse the library. And having, and reaching out and targeting local organizations to come into your library and work with you is a great way to get that organization to want to partner with you or want to support you later on. So um, community engagement. So like I said, uh, new resident visits, I really would love to see some kind of library program where, uh, you know, some kind of gift baskets get sent to anybody who moves into the neighborhood. In San Mateo County here, we had a program uh, through Redwood City where anybody born in the county got a book and um, a piece of paper about the importance of literacy with um, uh, the importance of literacy with new with with babies and toddlers and stuff like that. So it, it hit them right in the very beginning. Um, and better librarians with key allies. This is my this is that new librarian job that we have. You know, getting him involved in the Rotary Club, getting him involved in Kiwanis or the Chamber of Commerce, or just. Um, getting involved in uh, city council, not being on city council probably because, you know, there's some conflict of interest, but going to city council meetings or going to the PTA meetings. There's so many things going on in, in any community that uh, having a key person there who is the voice of the library will build up such a strong relationship with your community. It's, it's incredibly important. Um, library card sign-up month. Um, you know, I, I talked about that door-to-door -door library card sign-up. Uh, John, I don't know if I can make the offer, but I'm going to do it anyway. But if anybody wants to do a door-to-door -door library card campaign, every library would love to give your library uh, pizzas for the night um, in order to uh, help thank the people for getting people out for uh, library card sign-up month for going door-to-door. -door. And it's just such a huge concept. All right, um, so things, things you can do. Uh, get out and walk. Uh, go around your community, walk around your community, just take a walk and, and say hi to people. Um, tweet at the mayor or city council. A volunteer library brigade, we're starting one in the Bay Area who wants to start a, chart, a cheerleading group for libraries to do, at, um, to do like parades, um, cheerleading, at, cheerleading at parades. Um, uh, you know, having mini libraries set up, those those small free libraries are great just as a constant reminder that libraries are there and around. Um, and showing off your staff on social media, um, getting people out and getting their face in front of the people is really, really important. So to do list, in three days, start spending some money on your Facebook pages. Show off staff on your social media. Um, and, and start ramping up your social media by targeting your ads to your community. Uh, three weeks, do the personal community inventories. Um, set that first new meeting with, and, and have two with old allies. So, I mean, that just means going out and showing up at a city council meeting, um, emailing your mayor or your, your city manager or somebody on your city council and saying, hey, let's go out for coffee, let's do something um, together, let's get involved in a project together. Um, that's super important. In three months, walk a precinct. Once again, library card sign-up, door-to-door. We'd love it. 
Um, we want to get you involved in that. Um, and three years can be in the library coalition of this place. Um, and I want to, and I kind of want to leave off with a message um, for you guys. And this is something that we learned from Ken Haycock, who was the, the previous dean of SLIS. Uh, and he sat down and he talked to us for a little while. One of the key things that he said to us uh, that just resonates with us over and over and over again is that people don't do things for you or for your library or for your librarians because they like you. They do things for you or your library or your librarians because they perceive that you like them. Uh, it's just a radical shift in changing, I think, a uh, radical shift in thinking. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, we are here to answer them. Uh, great. Uh, thank you both uh, John and Patrick for uh, excellent presentation and helping us um, understand a little more uh, the importance of this and also pointing out uh, both legally and, and uh, what a library can do, what a board of trustees can do, and what an organization like every library uh, can do with regard to your status uh, as a sort of a super PAC versus uh, a, a nonprofit type organization. And it certainly seems to fill a niche in our field that was sorely lacking. So uh, we do have some time. Um, if anybody has questions um, and you would like to uh, ask uh, John or Patrick something, you can either put it into the chat box and we'll read it, um, or if you want to grab the mic, uh, do so or raise your hand and uh, let us know if you have a question or comment. Sure. There's a, a question coming in from, um, oh, sorry, I just jumped, from uh, Dina Gould. Uh, she says, uh, and Patrick, I want you to fill this one in. She says, attending library union meeting this weekend, as I'm not a hired librarian as yet, what one message can I bring to this meeting? Well, uh, a library union meeting can mean a bunch of different things. So I'm not sure what the purpose of the union is or what the purpose of the meeting is. Um, the one message I would have is some kind of story of impact, some kind of personal reason maybe why you're a librarian um, and why libraries are important to you specifically. Um, some kind of personal story. And, and I would think in addition to the stories, um, uh, pictures or video or some other type of um, uh, illustration or some kind of media, uh, certainly with regard to the way in which people respond to media today, uh, in, in addition to text, I think would uh, be effective as well. If I can also say about uh, a union is set up, if this is a labor union, and Dina, if you can jump on the chat and, and, and let us know, if it's a, if it's a, a public employees union, uh, they're set up as a 501c6, which lets them do some things. Okay, thanks. It is a labor uh, labor membership meeting. Um, they're set up as a 501c6, which means that they can be an ally, an endorser, and a funder uh, of groups like Every Library, uh, as well as local ballot initiative campaigns, local, local uh, vote yes committees. Um, the union has in many jurisdictions, not everyone, but in many jurisdictions, the chance to bring out their, their members to do walking and phoning on behalf of library campaigns that are that are happening out in the field. So, you know, if there's something that's hot in your area, we should probably chat a little bit about strategy. But in general, the the union community um, can and should be showing up in support of these fun, public funding initiatives. Let me thank uh, both John and Patrick for being with us today. I also want to. Um, Thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Anthony Vernier, who's online with us today. Uh, it was Anthony who actually put John and Patrick in touch with me to help make this colloquium possible. So uh, I want to uh, thank him uh, for that and uh, thank everybody for uh, your time and attention. And um, let me just uh, remind everybody that our next colloquium presentation will be um, on the 16th of April, 
uh, the day after you've done your taxes, so you won't have that to worry about anymore. And it will be our own Dr. Michael Stevens and Kyle Jones who did the uh, uh, hyperlinked library a class last um, semester as a MOOC and they're going to be reporting on that experience and what they learned and, and how MOOCs can be used uh, uh, as an educational tool. So that's about a month from now and we will get some uh, messages out about that in advance. Thank you again for uh, being here today.